Hi there. Welcome to the From Lab to Launch podcast by Qualio, where we share inspiring stories from the people on the front lines of life sciences. Tune in and leave inspired to bring your life-saving products to the world. Hi, everyone, and welcome to From Lab to Launch by Qualio. I'm Meg, your host. Thanks for tuning in today. Before we get started, we love it if you've rated the podcast. It's easy to do and share it with any of your science nerd friends. We know you have some. If you'd like to be on the show, please see the show notes for an application and we'll get connected that way. I'm really excited for today's episode. We have Greg Bullington, co-founder and CEO of Magnolia Medical Technologies with us. Greg has led all aspects of company development since inception, including clinical trial design, execution and publication, broad product pro- portfolio development, creation of a new national standard of care for sepsis testing accuracy, rapid revenues growth commercial commercialization, and intellectual property and enforcement strategy, not to mention raising over $125 million. He's pretty much done it all. Greg has a wide range of experience from leading engagements and working closely with senior executive teams at over 50 companies ranging from Fortune 500 Fortune 100 company corporations to venture backed and early stage startups as a consultant, advisor, and investor. Greg has also had expertise in intellectual property with more than 100 issued patents and over 50 patents pending. That's quite an introduction. So, with that, let's bring him in. Welcome from To Lab to Launch, Greg. Thanks, Meg. Appreciate you guys having me. Great. Yeah, happy to have you here. Um, that intro really barely touched on Magnolia Medical Technologies. Can you tell us a little bit more about the company and its mission to zero? You bet. So really, our, our focus uh, as an organization is on the elimination of the misdiagnosis of sepsis. And sepsis is a condition uh, that is driven by blood infection, and it turns out to be the number one leading cause of death, costs, and readmissions for patients in hospitals nationwide. And the real problem with sepsis is there are challenges and issues in diagnosing sepsis. So on average, in a typical hospital, 40% of positive sepsis blood tests are wrong. And those patients typically are subjected to all the treatments and extended length of stay and all the risks that come along with that. So our mission uh, at an aggregate level is to eliminate the misdiagnosis of sepsis. So every time we diagnose a patient, we are diagnosing and treating that patient accurately based on uh, high quality, accurate, timely diagnostic information. 40% accuracy, that is a s- staggering, like I wouldn't want that on a pregnancy test. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's crazy, um, crazy inaccurate. So, and thinking about, you know, over treatment with antibiotics, I'm sure there's even a larger issue besides just the patient at, in the hospital, it's as a society and as a healthcare system, the cost of overtreating with antibiotics is huge as well. Uh, unquestionably. And it's, uh, it's a, a problem that has been pervasive really for a century plus as we've used blood culture as a foundational technology to diagnose infections. And this issue around contamination or false positive results has, uh, has been pervasive. Uh, it's largely been accepted. I think in part because it's a complicated issue and most lay people don't uh, really have a a full understanding or appreciation of what a blood infection is or the kinds of bugs that can cause infection versus those that are, um, you know, just living on our skin and and are not problematic. Uh, It would be akin, though, as you point out, you know, 40 percent inaccurate pregnancy test results would never be accepted uh, broadly. and similarly. Uh, if we thought about this in the context of a, a cancer screening or cancer diagnostic test, if we were trying to diagnose blood cancers and 40 out of 100 times we told a patient, hey, you have leukemia. We admitted that patient to the hospital. We initiated a chemotherapy regimen for a whole week and 40 out of 100 times came back to tell the patient that we were sorry, that we had made a, a mistake in the diagnosis that led us to treat them with chemotherapy for a week. I think there would be public outcry, but the reality is that's exactly what happens today. And patients that come to the hospital or are inpatient in the hospital with symptoms that they may have an infection or may have sepsis, 
Uh, these patients are really typically in a very fragile state. They're very sick to begin with. And the last thing their body can tolerate, as you point out from an antibiotic standpoint, is being carpet bombed for a week with an antibiotic regimen they shouldn't be receiving. Antibiotics cause significant challenges and downstream toxicities that uh, create a, a lot of issues for patients. Certainly, they can be life-saving if, in fact, you do have an infection. But again, you know, to be in a place where 40 out of 100 times we're making a decision on the basis of an inaccurate blood test, that's uh, something we find uh, intolerable. And so we're committed to, to solving that problem for the world. That's amazing. Um, that is a huge issue and um, pervasive, as you said, is what drives that inspiration behind focusing on this blood culture and in testing and improving it? So I started my career in the strategy consulting industry and had an opportunity to work on a number of really interesting projects in the cancer innovation, uh, the cancer therapy innovation space. And at the time, there was a totally new treatment modality uh, in the oncology space uh, called active immunotherapy. And so I had uh, several years of exposure to uh, the establishment and rapid growth of a totally new uh, treatment modality. Uh, I also had the opportunity to work with uh, a number of the large uh, Blue, Cl Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance companies. Uh, and so I kind of had a combination of perspectives. And then I was uh, introduced to the chief of pathology at one of the University of Washington hospitals who had committed his whole career really to improving patient safety and quality as a volunteer with the College of American Pathologists. And this was a, an issue he had seen really in problematic ways in his own institution where there had been autopsies that the ultimate cause of death for that patient was an antibiotic associated complication. And going back to do the chart review, most frequently the blood test that informs those antibiotic therapies is the blood culture. And he recognized that issue of an average of 40% false positive results, meaning that those patients were unnecessarily subjected to all of this risk that drove poor outcomes. And so his goal was to solve that before he retired. And so we partnered, uh, hard to believe, well over a decade ago, but um, we've been committed to building our company on the basis of scientific evidence and clinical data. And I think that's what's put us in a really unique position for having created a, a totally new national standard of care because the performance of our product uh, and the performance of the overall mission to zero that we implement with our customers uh, in a typical environment will reduce those false positives by 90% or a 10 times improvement to uh, the current accepted standard of care. And talk about, you know, reduction in patient harm, reduction in waste for antibiotics that are prescribed unnecessarily, and just reducing, you know, the amount of bacteria res or bac antibiotic resistant bacteria that that can come out of that. So kudos to you guys. It's a, a lot of innovation um, for the greater good for, for patients and I think the healthcare system at large. It's really amazing. Yeah, the only way we can stave off the continued pressure, <laughs> if you will, from an antibiotic resistance standpoint is to reduce the unnecessary sure. use of antibiotics, particularly our most powerful, most potent antibiotics which are typically used to treat patients that are suspected of having a bloodstream infection or sepsis. So this represents a very low hanging fruit way to take a significant bite out of the unnecessary use of antibiotic category. And that does have, as you point out, really meaningful public health, health. benefits. And, uh, you know, we've seen that several studies published using our technology, showing the incremental impact in the reduction of vancomycin use and the reduction of overall antibiotic use. Uh, and that's a, a big deal. I did not tell you that I started my career in public health. So this one is a little near and dear to my heart. So um, we've talked a little bit about your novel solution. Could you walk us through the technology and how it works? You bet. So the, the key novel insight that our co-founder, Dr. Patton, had uh, really came down to a, a question of what was the root cause of contamination and what was the root cause of uh, the presence of these organisms that would falsely identify that a patient had an infection. And what he really recognized was that for ever effectively using blood culture 
Uh, it was dictated that the first blood that was collected from a patient would go into the blood culture, the sterile blood culture bottles, and then that would be shipped off for incubation. And then you would do potentially additional subsequent blood collection for alternate testing. And what he realized is that every time we stick a, a, a needle through a patient's skin, even if we perfectly cleaned the skin surface and we waited the appropriate amount of time and we didn't repalpate the patient's vein, you know, all those things typically happen, particularly in a, uh, an emergency department or a high acuity environment. But he recognized that we can disinfect skin, but we can't sterilize skin. So you're going to end up with some foreign biological matter that is not in the patient's bloodstream in the actual sample to be tested. And so he recognized the need to really come up with a mechanical solution that would allow us to take that first little bit of blood that can have skin fragments and tissue and sweat glands and hair follicles and get rid of that. But then in that same sterile closed system, have the ability to collect a subsequent volume of blood that really is just from the patient's bloodstream for testing. Uh, and it, it sounds, um, you know, simple and it is, but it was a, a major innovation and a, a change to the standard of care. And as I mentioned, you know, we've demonstrated now 10 times better results using our technique and technology uh, combined. So on that vein, I'm going to get very punny here. Um, yeah. For the nurses doing the venipuncture, is there a change in how they do their process or is there an impact to patient care and, and how they feel the, the blood draw or is that all pretty much the same and the technology improves that? So one of the key elements uh, in creating that vein to bottle sterile blood flow pathway is to have all the components actually pre-assembled uh, and then sterilized as a single unit. So there's actually a benefit to the workflow in that rather than needing to set up an aseptic environment and very carefully uh, set the various supplies out and make sure you have sterile gloves before you start taking you know, the syringe out of one package and a needle out of another package, all of that is done in our system and it's all pre-assembled and sterile. So you just open one package and then you're ready to attain vascular access. So uh, it's a, an improvement in the efficiency and workflow from that standpoint. Uh, and then there is uh, just one small step associated with uh, locking off the initial sequestered blood before you collect the relevant blood sample to test. Sounds like an improvement to have all of your supplies kitted for you in advance. Um, I feel like that would almost, I used to do venipunctures also in a previous life, and that would also take the time to get all the things ready as much as it would take to get the blood draw sometimes. For sure. So. Improving the workflow too, and that doesn't hurt. Um, great. In your leadership role, what challenges have you encountered in bringing these innovations to market and how have you overcome them? Well, you have a, a lot of experience in the healthcare space, it sounds like. So I, I would say in general, uh, people don't like change. People in healthcare really don't like change, particularly in a hospital environment. So there have been a lot of challenges in terms of just figuring out creatively how do we break the inertia of how things have always been. Uh, and, you know, certainly COVID created a lot of major strife for acute care hospitals across the country. Staffing issues, staffing shortages, traveling nurses, um, you know, per diem nursing staffs, all kinds of issues and challenges that the hospitals have had to navigate through. So, Unfortunately, the cost of that oftentimes is an inability to prioritize and focus safety initiatives or quality improvement initiatives. So I think most of the challenges we've had to figure out how to surmount and navigate have been associated with trying to convince and demonstrate with real scientific evidence the reasons and rationale behind why we should prioritize this particular change. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, sepsis is the number one leading cause of death, costs, and readmissions in hospitals nationwide. So uh, from our viewpoint and perspective, it should be an absolute top priority. And uh, there is definitive correlation in terms of preventable morbidity and mortality uh, associated with addressing the false positive sepsis blood test issue that we solve. Uh, and so... We spent a lot of time working with the large societies, working with major state hospital associations, 
uh, working with the CDC and CMS, Medicare, NQF, and, and other uh, large organizations that are focused on patient safety and quality uh, to help set the stage and, and really accelerate change in the interest of patient safety and preventing unnecessary harm. Interesting. COVID can really have messed up things for some of us. Um, yeah, the tr- 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 yeah. A down it turns. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, that inertia is a, is a real thing and a challenge uh, trying to change things and get uh, value committees at hospitals to adopt new and novel products can be a challenge for sure. Yeah. How do you see the future of blood culture testing evolving and what does role does Magnolia medical technologies play in that future? Well, our commitment, as I mentioned previously, really is to eliminate the misdiagnosis of sepsis for the world. So uh, we've done, I think, uh, an outstanding job at setting a totally new foundational standard of care here in the United States. Uh, we've had very strong adoption from a commercial standpoint and strong sustained success. And obviously, there are many opportunities to augment the foundation now of the work that we're doing with our Steripath flagship product line and augmenting that with additional value, with additional additional features. Uh, we have a, a software platform that provides uh, significant incremental and additional insights on the clinical as well as the economic value that we're able to drive uh, that will really help some of those value analysis committee uh, processes and and decisions. So uh, we are in a really exciting position and we're really in the early stages now with uh, coming up on 500 hospital customers and uh, being in a place where we can really make a difference rapidly because we've driven that change in mindset. We've driven that change in the standard of care. And so now it's incumbent on us to continue to add more incremental value and uh, pursue that goal of eliminating the misdiagnosis of sepsis globally. Very cool. And I'm curious what other um, misdiagnosed treatments you guys might endeavor on in the future. Um, but sepsis is a good one to tackle if it's the leading cause of death. That's a great place to start. Yeah, it's uh, been a surprising elements from my standpoint. So the collaboration and the opportunities I've had to spend uh, a lot of time with Dr. Patton and his hospital environment, uh, as well as across our whole customer base. To your point, there are actually a, a shocking number of uh, diagnostic tests that have significant variance and variability in terms of their predictability, in terms of their accuracy. And so we have a whole prioritized point of view on uh, additional areas where we can add value by dramatically improving the quality of the specimens that are being analyzed. And ultimately, that provides the right information to treat the patient appropriately and drives better outcomes and lower costs, which is what we're all uh, focused on doing. Absolutely. As Qualio is a quality management software company, and I am on our quality team, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about quality. Sure. Um, with such innovation and velocity at Magnolia Medical Technologies, as the CEO, how do you drive the quality culture there? Uh, we have a fantastic and highly talented team of quality engineers and experts uh, that have done a fantastic job really building a system. It's all based on an electronic and automated backbone and really the focus that we have in terms of ensuring that the high volume of product that we're developing and uh, shipping out to hospitals each and every day, you know, meet the quality standards of really helping us achieve our mission is really the, the goal and the target. So we have a great team, we have great processes, we have great systems. Uh, and to your point about the culture of quality, that is first and foremost in what we do each and every day. And everyone in the organization fully embraces and uh, really lives by that credo. I think with the mission to bring misdiagnosis is down to zero, quality improvement and continuous improvement has to be at your core. So. Absolutely. Great. Um, kind of pivoting on to raising capital, that can be quite challenging in today's market. What advice would you give to other founders who are looking, listening now and looking to raise capital in the coming months? Absolutely. It's, um, I think, as everyone knows, a, a difficult macroeconomic environment uh, in particular today, given all that uh, is going on from a 
geopolitical as well as just financial systems uh, standpoint. And the the markets are uh, still challenged. It's been kind of a stagnant market in many ways over the last 12 to 18 months. So uh, there's optimism moving into 2024 from uh, most of the folks that I, I talk with. So I think that continuing to stay the course for those that are in the early stages of building new platforms and new technologies that solve significant unmet needs uh, is critical. I think foundationally in the med tech space, it is all about evidence and what evidence do you have that your innovation and technology delivers true value, both to the patient as well as to the system and the hospital. Uh, unfortunately, the way that our economic system within the healthcare space works uh, there really does have to be that corresponding proof around delivering lower costs and better outcomes uh, combined. So I think there are a lot of things that can be done for very limited uh, capital or with very limited capital, rather. There are a lot of really great uh, collaborators out there that are physicians that uh, have interest in new research topics and have interest in uh, publishing new innovations in the literature. So. Even without the ability to access at scale capital today, I think there's a lot of progress that can be made for uh, very limited investments by being creative, collaborating with KOLs that are really passionate about certain uh, areas and spaces that would correspond with the technologies that are being developed. Uh, and then obviously NIH and other sources of non-dilutive funding are still uh, available uh, and, and a great avenue for a lot of organizations today. Uh, given some of the, the broader macro challenges in raising institutional capital. Yeah, those alternative funding sources are always good to mention too. Absolutely. Great. In your vision for Magnolia Medical Technologies, what are the big next steps and innovations that we can expect to see in the coming years? So as I mentioned, misdiagnosis of sepsis is our overall goal and mission. And there are multiple legs to that stool. So our focus from a forward innovation standpoint really is to holistically solve this problem. And we've started with a really important foundational issue uh, around specimen integrity and prevention of contamination or false positive results. So moving down the line, you can expect that kind of this piece of the pu puzzle is solved. We're focused on solving the whole puzzle. So that's, that will be the, the driver of innovation. You know, our vision and, and hope is that with the efforts that have been undertaken to establish a new standard of care, uh, with the support we've been able to garner from uh, bipartisan members of Congress, with the support we've been able to rally with state hospital associations and many other stakeholders within the patient safety and patient quality advocacy circles, uh, our hope really would be that we rapidly increased penetration and adoption of both the technique and the technology that has been proven to solve this problem. Uh, and today I would estimate we're in the, the single digits in terms of penetration uh, across the United States uh, with our technology solution. And so that leaves a, a lot of patients that need our help. And that's really what fuels our uh, commitment, passion, and efforts each and every day to, to go out and be in a position to help as many patients as we can, as quickly as we can. Very cool. I'm really excited to see how you guys um, grow in the coming years and excited to see that penetration into the market grow and those patient outcomes and that mission to zero come to a rela reality, excuse me, a reality here in the States at least. That would be amazing. Absolutely. So our last question is more of a fun one we'd love to ask each of our guests. If we ran into you at a bookstore or at your local library, in which section would we find you? <laughs> Good question. I would say one of two. So uh, I love photography and I love beautiful pictures of vistas, landscapes, the outdoors. So uh, the, the coffee table book section that has all those wonderful uh, photo books probably would be uh, the, the first. And on my way out to check out, uh, probably find me in the uh, leadership and business uh, systems effectiveness and, and efficiency section. It's a, uh, an amazing area with uh, tons of content and uh, certainly an area of interest for me. Great. Thanks for sharing. 
Thank you so much for joining us today on From Lab to Launch by Qualio. Where can our listeners go to follow along and connect with you? You bet. Our website is magnolia-medical.com. And uh, we have a, a company profile on LinkedIn and I have uh, my own LinkedIn profile, obviously. So if uh, there are folks that are interested in connecting, um, please reach out. Yeah, we'll post those in the show notes. Thanks so much, Greg. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of From Lab to Launch, brought to you by Qualio. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and give the show a positive review. It really helps us out. For more information about Qualio, our guest today, or to be a guest on a future episode, please refer to the show notes. Until next time.